Thank you all for inviting me here. I am so excited to be back in my birth state of Kansas. When um, I, I have a Google alert on my name, so I get these like emails every once in a while, and when there was a blurb in the Hayes uh, newspaper, it was like, it's better than having a blurb in the New York Times. The very fact that Hayes is writing about me, little old me, just like, like blew my mind. It made me feel so good. So thanks for, uh, thanks for having me here. Unfortunately, with this particular series, I'm used to talking to people on the East Coast, and so I feel like half of my presentation is people who already know. So I'm already preaching to the choir, but you know, please forgive me. Um, this is a series titled Accidentally Kansas. I started this after I left graduate school. I went to grad school in um, Ohio University, Athens, Ohio, and uh, came back and started doing this particular body of work. And these are, again, simple tabletop dioramas. I'm like um, uh, building and photographing these. When I was living in Kansas, population 3,500, one stoplight that you know blinked red constantly. I think we had two stoplights in town, maybe one that went through all three colors and then the one that constantly blinked red. But <laughs> growing up in the Midwest, growing up in Kansas, growing up in Norton, I just remember laying in the grass and seeing the contrails going over my, going over, you know, across the sky. And I was so, with like, I wish a plane would crash so something exciting would happen for my town. <laughs> but you have to remember, I was a seven-year-old then, you know, these days. Thanks, no, no, no plane crashes, please. But what got me working on this body of work is this particular artist named Richard Mizrock. After I left graduate school, I was in Chicago. To, to put up a, a, an exhibition, and I went to the Museum of Contemporary Arts, and I saw his particular body of work. It was called Desert Cantos. And Richard Mizrock has been photographing various aspects of the desert for a long, long time, man's impact on the desert. And I'm standing in front of these large photographs having an epiphany. It's like, oh my god, look at this. Like, this guy has been going to the same place year after year and photographing all these different aspects. and. You know, I, I wish we had epiphanies on a weekly basis. I think you get maybe two of them in your lifetime, but this epiphany, I'm standing in front of this, my, my, my hair just like goes off my head, flips and comes back down. <laughs> and I'm thinking, wow, but I haven't lived in any place long enough to actually go back to and, and photograph except Norton, Kansas. I mean, I've lived in Kansas on and off. I've lived in Norton, Hayes, and Topeka, but I've only lived in Norton for nine years. It's the longest I've ever lived in one place until I moved to Brooklyn. And so I'm thinking, I'm out of grad school. I have $25 a week in my, as my budget. There's no way that I can actually go back and photograph Western Kansas, because honestly, you guys, there's not a whole lot out here. But there is. <laughs> but to the most, for most people, it's a straight road. It's some waving weed. It's some sunflowers. It's a lot of brown. And uh, so this is like where Norton is, that little red scribble is. And so instead of coming back and photographing my childhood, I just decided to bring my childhood to my studio. Because we're always told, you know, as artists, you should probably just work with what you know. And what I know was bad weather, small town Kansas. So, and I'm also not much of a traveler. I like to stay home and work rather than be a journalist on the road moving around. I'd rather just stay home and like, do my own thing. So instead of like traveling to Kansas and being a type of photographer that I'm not, I decided to bring Kansas to my studio. And so I started making these dioramas based on my childhood memories. Now, this is supposed to be a locust, but I didn't have a locust with me. This particular thing <laughs> fell on my work table when I was working at this art production company in Columbus, Ohio, and there's like all these nasty chemicals, and I, wake, you know, I go to work in the morning and there's this giant dragonfly. So, you see dragonfly, think locust. <laughs> or grasshopper. But you know what? You can't find grasshoppers in that part of Ohio, and you definitely can't find grasshoppers in Brooklyn, so I, you have to work with the materials you're given. So here I am, feather boa to make the waving wheat, and little miniature cows, and this particular dragonfly that I then photographed and like plopped on the back of the background for many, many exposures. And the two-headed dog. You know, this is back in the days of uh, DDT when it was making all kinds of weird things happening out in farmers' fields, and so I have my, my two-headed dog barking. And this is a really simplistic scene. This is like some bamboo shish kebab skewers, some plaster, some wood boards, and a little bit, a little tiny like farmhouse because I like to tell big stories, and so I like to actually make my photographs lie a little bit too. 
When I was thinking about this particular body of work, I actually wrote to FEMA back in the day when FEMA wasn't what it was. You can actually like, you know, hold your head high and say, I wrote to FEMA. And they used to give out these free guides. I don't even think they probably give them out anymore, but it was the Risks and Hazards Guide. And I just wanted to see what really what Kansas was about, even though I already knew it. You know, Wolf Creek, there's your earthquake zones, of course, snow and extreme cold, and tornadoes, right? And then I thought this was really interesting. This is where, this is where your old nuclear uh, missile silos. So you can see what, how old this particular publication is. And so everywhere there's a yellow dot used to be a, nu uh, a missile silo. Haven't they all been decommissioned? Because I heard that um, they've been turned into houses, like people have been buying them up for all of you, like uh, into lifers. Is that true? So I'm not lying when I tell other people this. Have you guys like been to these apartments? I think it'd be like the best, coolest place to live, except that I like sun and I like heat. And I just see these as cold and damp and dark. So, but I, I thought this was a pretty interesting little, a little guide. And these are the kind of things that I'm always like surrounding myself with. I like find these little snippets and I pick them up and I put them around my desk at, at work. And uh, horrible, isn't it? Yeah, okay. And these are the kind of things like when I, 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 read the, I read the newspaper, at least I used to every day. Now it's all on my, uh, my little Kindle. But these are the kind of things, again, I would, I would clip and, and leave around for inspiration. Isn't that a beautiful? Look how that, look how that train just accordioned into itself. It's just such a nice, beautiful design, you know? I don't think the people who live in that house thought that was such a great little thing, but it sure is an amazing thing to see in the newspaper because tragedy makes pretty pictures. Right? Okay. So this is like a little tabletop diorama. And, and we all know that whenever a tornado comes through, some poor farmer's cow always gets picked up and then dropped down in someone's neighborhood or someone in the middle of the town. I was living in Topeka, and I was in junior high when a tornado came through my particular neighborhood. And, uh, yes, there was a cow roaming around the neighborhood. And um, it was a quite an exciting experience. It was a little nerve-wracking because I was actually at a movie theater watching this Disney movie called Something Wicked This Way Comes. And right when it was starting to get scary, the uh, movie theater manager comes out and like says, Lori Nix, Lori Nix, will you please come to the front? And then I got booed by everyone in the movie theater because I basically ruined the movie for them. But my dad was outside just pacing around back and forth. And I like go, what's up, dad? He goes, you almost killed your mother. It's like, what? Why? It says, after she dropped you off, a tornado hit, and that tornado followed her station wagon all the way back to the front door. And it's true. Like, she was in her little yellow station wagon, and she saw that tornado behind her, and, and then she knew exactly what to do, which is roll the car windows down, which I think might be a myth. I'm not quite sure. We need to talk about tornado. And, and, but as soon as that tornado hit, you know, there goes my neighborhood. Our house was fine. The house next to us was fine. The house next to that, no roof. The house next to that, no house, you know. But it was really exciting because... Everyone survived. It was okay. She had yeah, some property damage, but for a kid in junior high, it was exciting because I was out in the woods just seeing what I could find, and I came across an oven, and I opened it up, and there was the most beautiful ham, golden brown, ready to eat because a tornado hit at 6 o'clock at night, and someone had the most beautiful ham, and there it is out in the middle of the woods. Yeah, it's so cool. And then floods. I was in um, undergrad, I think it was the great floods of 1993 when the whole Midwest was just like being inundated with storm after storm after storm. It was right as I was going to graduate school and I had a hard time even finding a passable bridge. I was living in um, Missouri at the time and we had to go to the upper reaches of Iowa to find a bridge over the Missouri and the Mississippi River so I could actually get to grad school in Athens, Ohio. And so I think about these things and I keep these memories in my mind and eventually spit them out as photographs again. And so here's our, you know, this is definitely what the M Missouri River looks like. It's all just mud and, and things coming down. And I used to like travel from Norton to Oklahoma every Christmas with my parents to, you know, to, I mean, with my parents to go see my grandmother. And of course, we were always stuck in various blizzards. And so that's us in the station wagon crying, Dad, Dad, I got to pee. When's the next road stop? When's the next stop? And it's always like five more miles away. So that's my poor family in the, in the uh, station wagon. And I always thought the Hindenburg crashed in Nebraska. Boy, was I wrong in a couple of states away. So, but, you know, these are my photographs, and I get to take, I get to take uh, liberties with them. So I'm still claiming that the Hindenburg crashed in Nebraska somewhere. And I used to work in a... In a um, 
a photo lab outside of Columbus, Ohio. So I was having a reverse commute with everyone else. Everyone was coming into Columbus and I was driving out of Columbus to go to my job. And one day I passed by this uh, burned out school bus at the side of the road. And it just made me laugh because I know it was the cool kids sitting in the back of the bus, probably like, you know, smoking and playing with lighters. But no, it's probably just <laughs> poor engine maintenance. But I thought that was really funny. Because I never got to take the bus because the town was too small to even have buses. I always got, ended up walking through the field, walking through the uh, horse pasture to get to school. So bus riding wasn't in my, uh, in my childhood. And of course, this is a pretty common occurrence out here in the Midwest, train derailment after train derailment. And this particular one is, is from DuPont. And it just like spewed its horrible, horrible chemicals all over the, uh, all over the ground. And again, taking more liberties. <laughs> Back when I was young, everyone drove station wagons rather than minivans. And so you'd be at a stoplight and you could always tell which kids were acting up in front of you because that station wagon would start rocking. And then you'd see the parents' arms like go back and like start beating on their kids, like <laughs> settle down. At least that's what it was in my station wagon because it was always me, my brother, my sister acting up and my dad was always like swatting at us. You don't get that these days with minivans and SUVs. You don't get to see the, you know, pummeled kids and acting up. <laughs> now I think that everyone's just too busy watching their DVDs that they don't even like even talk to each other in the car. I have no idea. But here, my this the, the story goes that me and my brother and her sister are all acting up. My dad turns around to swat at us and turns back around, sees the deer in the road, tries to miss the deer, off into the icy depths we plumb. We plummet to our uh cold, cold grave. Yeah. <laughs> but it's funny, right? <laughs> and so here, it's like, I, I sh I'm shooting film. I don't do any Photoshop manipulation. This is all like what you see is what you get. That's, that's dental floss as the iced over power lines and uh, little leaves and car and a little, uh, a little uh, matchbox car. And I got my Jesus light in the background shining down on us as our cathedral light. And tent revival, you know. <laughs> you just know those people are in there singing, I saw the light, right? I saw the light. <laughs> yeah, they saw the light. <laughs> so you can see I'm having a lot of fun. I really try to leave these narratives open-ended for you guys to bring in your own stories. And uh, so now that you have me in front of you, I'll give you my own little story. So I'm living in, um, I was living in Columbus, Ohio, doing most of that body work. I got a grant. It was enough to get me to Brooklyn to pay my first month, last month security deposit. So I packed my bags and went to New York and not to become an artist. I actually went there to, as a job. By day, I'm a printer, a color printer at a photo lab. And by night, I work on my, uh, the, you know, work on this stuff. And so I decided to pack my bags and move to New York so I could actually still continue to be a printer. And I'm done with my Kansas series. So now I'm in Brooklyn. I'm thinking about my, my time spent in Ohio. And I used to teach in a, in a, in a, southern, a college in southern Ohio. Um, and it's around Ironton and Portsmouth, Ohio. And it's in the middle of Wayne State National Forest. And there's not a whole lot of industry down there. So there's like one plant it's called the nuclear, it was a nuclear, um, it was a uranium extraction plant. And what they do is they take spent nuclear rods and try to extract what little uranium is left over before they decide to send this stuff off to Yucca Mountain. And it's like one of the biggest employers of this part of Ohio. And men will go deer hunting, like you know, young men and boys will go deer hunting during deer hunting season, A, for sport, and B, to have a little extra meat to put on the table during the uh, lean winter months. And it just blows my mind because when the deers get taken to the, to the check-in station, they actually actually have to be tested to make sure that they're still edible, that they're not radiated and not nuclear running around. And the cancer rate in this particular part of Ohio is just phenomenally huge. And so this was my my whole take on that. So I had my little clear deer at the bottom of the lake, you know, drinking that horrible, horrible water that the that the power plants like letting off and leaching into the environment. So my stuff does sometimes have a, an environmental bent, but I always try to twist it with a little bit of sense of humor to kind of like, it's like a sugar pill, you know, or not a sugar pill, but a little, a spoonful of sugar to make the, the medicine go down, as our Disney uh, movies tell us. 
And this is my um, Kansas meets Coney Island. I, when I moved to New York, I wasn't like really loving everything about New York. I, lived, I moved to a neighborhood where I was hearing like gunshots on a weekly basis. Um, I went out to uh, Coney Island for the first time, and it was at night, and there was this dead, um, creepy roller coaster off into off in the mist. And I really like things that kind of creep me out, you know. So, of course, I had to bring that creepy roller coaster back into my life. And so I made this uh, Kansas meets Coney Island uh, photograph. So the, 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 the two trucks are, are off on the side in the country. And one's a hormone truck and one's a milk truck. And they're, they're, they're you know, <laughs> they're uh, exchanging their, their goods, as, they, uh, as I like to think. <laughs> And people always ask me, what's one of my favorite images? And I have to say, oh, it's this one, um, lovingly called Floater. <laughs> because when I was in undergrad, in, uh, undergrad, I actually worked on a, on a sad little riverboat in St. Joe, Missouri, that was like trying to give river tours up and down the Missouri River. It can only go one direction, because the other direction was one of those like horse processing plants. So we can only go in one direction. <laughs> and I would always like every morning or every time I'd like get on the boat, I always have to look over the side of the boat to see if anything interesting has come down river because I was expecting like a, you know a couple of a couple of bodies here and there. And um, thank God I never saw it because now I'm a little older. I don't necessarily want to see or smell it. But there was a time where I was working and there was like a lot of rains up in Iowa and so the river had ra had raised a lot and. All kinds of stuff were coming down river because I guess farmers like to like pull their dead animals to the side and hopefully like the river will pick it up. And so I'm standing there. It's a beautiful day. I'm watching like I'm I'm seeing tires come down and trash and a ladder and all of a sudden I see the world's largest tree trunk just slowly coming out. It's like gray and white, like it's little little um, tree arms in the air and it gets a little closer. It's like oh god, that's not a that's not a tree. That's a that's a cow. I mean that that's a big pig. That's a sow. And it was like so white and so bloated, I thought it was gonna explode by the time it got to me. It was the most, I'm sorry, I'm probably grossing you guys out. <laughs> so those are the kind of things I think. So floater, here you guys might see a, a dead body, but really what it is is just paper towel ever so carefully folded. And the, the cattails is just a sculpey, this little polymer clay, and if you could really see it, you'd see my thumbprint still in the, uh, in the clay. And then the green cattails is just cardboard left over from old Kodak paper boxes. And those little green hills in the background, that's just dill I got at the grocery store. So really simplistic, maybe 20 by 24 inches altogether. And red sky. And again, these are all open-ended narratives, but I, since you have me, I'll go ahead and tell you the story. So my grandfather um, lived in Oklahoma. He likes to go out on the lake and drink with his buddies. He's out there one night in a nice... Um, cool February evening and I think they had just a little bit too much to drink because sometimes when men like get together and drink they like to you know man love on each other pat each other on the back huh, huh, huh. well my dad <laughs> well my dad had my granddad had false teeth and somehow during that man love session where they're like patting each other on the back his teeth like fall out of his mouth and down into the bottom of the lake and he's so upset because it took him good six months to break in these false teeth so he actually found someone with a with a, a wet a wetsuit to go down there, and look for six hours for his teeth. And damn it, the guy never found it. So <laughs> my granddad had to start all over with a new a new new set of teeth. And so this is like dedicated to my my grandma, my granddad, Daddy Nicks. And this is called Lover's Leap. I usually normally don't put figures in my scenes very often. But this one, and you, it's depending on how, what your own personal relationships are like, is how you read it. There's a man on the bridge, and there's a woman jumping off, and you have to realize, did he push her? Did they make a lover's pact and jump together, and he chickened out? <laughs> is she trying to get away from him? Who knows? That's really up to you. And so this is like, this is like kind of like Terre Haute type sort of setting, not quite as grandiose as New York, but as you can see. And I'm really, I love it because I have a, uh, I have a, a um, fog machine that I got off the internet. And I love to use it. And so there's like a little fog coming up through that pipe. And the reason I like to use it is because it's vanilla scented. So it smells good as I'm working. <laughs> and this is what it looks like when you fly into Kansas City, right? Just kind of snotty green, fleshy brown. <laughs> but I do. I love Kansas. 
don't get me wrong. I do. And I like to set myself up with problem solving because, again, I'm not doing any sort of Photoshop. So my problem here was how do I have birds, you know, casting shadows on the water without, you know, just clicking it in in Photoshop. And the same with this. How do you get birds flying through the sky? And I love birds. I think they're just the most amazing creatures. I just don't necessarily trust them all on the line together when they're all lined up. <laughs> And so I'm still living in Brooklyn. I'm having a good time. And now I'm like really starting to take inspiration again. I, I take inspiration from my surroundings. And in New York, I've been just reading the New York Times a lot. So this is a series that's called Lost, because that's kind of how I felt when I moved there. Because it took me a good six months to even like the fact that I was in New York. I was ready to move back to Ohio at any, any given moment, because it sure is a lot easier there. And so this is my California forest fire. And the hardest thing for me to do when I'm working in model and miniature is to create atmosphere and create depth. And so here's that fog machine going to create that good smelling vanilla scented smoke. And that's me in my Airstream. I'm watching TV. I have no idea there's a fire raging, raging down, my, down my valley. And again, these are the kind of things that I'm always collecting and keeping around me to keep everything in perspective. All I see this and I see West Nile virus. I think, think of all the mosquitoes up there. And that place still exists. And I thought this was a pretty interesting f uh, photograph from a, a, a journalist. I mean, it's a horrible accident. These kids were, um, well, they were like being starved to death in the basement. I just thought that, that the photographer had a really interesting aspect and probably was laying on his stomach and shooting up at the house to give it that creepy, ominous feel because it's a horrible, horrible story. And I thought this was kind of an interesting approach to like this whole green energy. I feel like those things are like, like ominous, like they're going to come down and like chop my little head off. So it was like an interesting approach to something so, you know, green energy, but this thing just kind of like struck an odd nerve in me. And I love that. I would love to go and see this for myself, this giant statue of like, you know, Russia's great, Russia's amazing. We don't write, we don't have this kind of statuary, this celebration of America the way that they do in Russia. You know, we have, you know, Big Abe Lincoln. And we have like, you know, an obelisk. But to see something to say like we're winners like that, yeah, that's not quite America enough. We just do it in other ways. And so I'm always looking at my peers. Now this, I wanted to actually hop on a plane and come see for myself. This is down in, uh, down in Texas. And the, it's a giant spider nest. Did you guys see this in the news when it came out? The park ranger who found it said he could hear it and smell it before he actually saw it because there were so many small, insects trapped inside this giant spider web and it was just like vibrating and like wow now that's cool from afar i would still like to i'd still like to have seen that and so there and so i'm taking some of these ideas of creepiness and things that kind of like get to me and and putting them into my photographs because i again birds on a wire don't trust them one bit <laughs> And that's me, the hapless person who I knew I shouldn't have crossed the bridge, but instead I did. And now I'm bound, down in the valley. I'm on my back, and that, that, that bird is doing that 1970s screech over my head that I won't even attempt to do. But you know that horrible sound effect that they put in all the movies? Yeah. And I eat a lot of sushi, and I see like the, uh, the wood, the wood cut in a lot, all these sushi restaurants, and it kind of just like burns your hole in your head. But again, this is all about your interpretation of relationships. And so there's these two little life jackets floating out in the ocean. And I just ask myself, you always hear these stories of people who fell off the, the cruise ship. The cruise ship is a giant mall on water. How hard is it to fall off a mall? You know, it's like, how do these people fall off boats? I just don't get it. When's the last time someone fell off a mall, right? I just like, it just amazes me that people can fall off a giant cruise ship. Whatever. I would, you can't get me to go on a cruise ship. Never, ever. No. And this is a photograph called Junkyard, and I really dedicate it to my dad. So we live in St. Joe, Missouri, and the downtown is like a dying little sad little town, and there's these giant piles of, of um, recycled metal that you see from the, uh, from the interstate. And it's just beautiful because he's like these giant pound, uh, mounds of just, just rusty, rusty metal. And so I decided to do a junkyard kind of based on that whole idea. And I just love the fact that you have your little house, and there's a junkyard dog, and there's a gazing globe because my mom collects gazing globes. She has like 35 in her tiny little yard. So it's just a, I had to have one of my own. 
And the longer that you look at this, the more you might get out of it. Because one of the cars has like a little wash me, like scratch into the back of the car. And there's a phantom car with its headlights still on. And if you look close enough, you might find Batmobile because there is one in there. I have my friends help me whenever they can. And my friend was going to a, to a flea markets over in Jersey. And he'd bring me back, you know, bag after bag of Hot Wheels. And I would like, you know, it's like fantastic. Hot Wheels by the pound so I can make my own little junkyard. And my commute takes me over the Manhattan Bridge every day. I live in Brooklyn. I work in Manhattan. And every time I'm over the water, I'm always like curious as to what's underneath me besides mafia hits. <laughs> and so here I think that the, uh, the uh, this is one, this was called uh, Bounty. The uh, HMS Bounty is a ship that was ne has never been found. They think it's off of the coast of Australia, but I like to think it's over in the East River. <laughs> And I have a couple of cats at home, and the hardest part was keeping them out of my scene. I'd come home at night after work, and a cat would be in the middle of the scene because she could smell the little piece of octopus that I had left in the scene. Of course, I would take it out every night because it takes me a couple of days to photograph these. So I'd shoot, and I'd carefully get my little octopus legs back out of the scene and put them into the refrigerator, and then the next morning I see the cat kind of like messing around in my scene. Um, Love this scene. The, the funniest thing about this is like making the tiny little air freshener and putting it in with little with little um, tweezers. And because of the cats, I've been collecting cat whiskers for years. And I have a whole box full of them, not knowing what to do until I needed to make little cacti. And so I had a nice stuff, little, little cat whiskers became my little cactus uh, pointy things. And then, you know, cut them down. So can you guys, yeah, down there. And I still have a lot of cat whiskers and I still collect them. And Treehouse. This was like kind of interesting because, um, you know, I'll source some of my materials if I can't make them. And here, these are these little collectible plastic dogs you can get at the uh, farm and fleet stores. Um, Blue Stem and Quality Farm and Fleet and TSC Tractor Supply. And I needed them all to look up into the tree house, but mostly the dogs just look kind of forward. So I'm at my work table and I just felt so horrible. I'd take a, I'd take a little handsaw and I have to saw the heads off of them at a certain <laughs> angle. And then I saw the heads again at a different angle and kind of like move them around and then glue them back together. And I felt like such an, oh, I just felt so horrible sawing these little dogs' heads off. But it was all for the greater picture of the artwork. And the little white guy in front, he was the first one I worked with. Well, he looks like he's been run over a couple times because he is just not proportionally correct. <laughs> and uh, Paradise. This is like from a newspaper article I read about this guy who told his family he was going to throw himself over Niagara Falls and no one ever believed him. So he did. He threw himself over Niagara Falls and survived. And as soon as they pulled him out of the water, they decided to take him to the loony bin. He says, but why? I told you guys I was going to do it. So here I have all these little barrels floating around because I grew up on a very steady diet of cartoons. And so here in my little my picturesque scene, you see all these little barrels floating throughout the water of all the people who tried to ride them over the waterfalls. And parade. This was about seven months in the making. And again, not quite New York, so let's just call it Terre Haute. It has a nice little, a nice little uh, Thanksgiving Day parade. And here, everyone is like in the in um, uh, in the travel agency, and they're all heading out of town because things are just going just going crazy. And that around that little fish balloon, you have a bunch of little cats all hanging out. And so I have I try to have as much fun as possible when I'm making these scenes. Uh, this is called um, Outpost. There's like these giant uh, listening arrays out in the middle of New Mexico. Fantastic. I hope you guys can come and go and see them sometime, you know, if you ever get the chance. And so here I've got this little lone female hitchhiker by the road, and she's got her thumb out, and she's waiting for a ride, and it's going to be the wrong ride that's going to come and get her. <laughs> and I, again, I have my friends help me as much as possible. My friend Dan sat there and made the little, the little, uh, the little VLAs for me, the uh, very large arrays. And so growing up, I watched a lot of television, a lot of movies. I remember being six years old in the movie theater watching this kind of thing. And these things had huge impacts on me, mostly because the, the, the monkey on, the, on your right looked just like my next door neighbor, Rosie. <laughs> Minus the beard, I swear to God, that's my neighbor, Rosie. And so this has always had a very soft spot in my heart because I just love Rosie to death. 
And I still tear up. I've seen this movie a thousand times, and I still get choked up every time I come across this and I see that we're, uh, we are responsible for our own demise. Love this movie. Huge. And Towering Inferno. I'm six years old, and my parents are actually bringing me to the movie theater to watch these kind of things. Like, what kind of parents were you that you would let me watch these horrible graphic things? And I'm like just eyes wide open. I can't believe what I'm seeing and just loving every minute of it. And who doesn't love Steve McQueen? And there we are, you know, Towering Inferno. And there they are, rescuing Faye Dunaway, pre-CGI, you know, all model, horrible little scenes. Love this stuff. But this, and then Logan's Run, the very first science fiction movie I've ever seen in my life, and huge impact. Oh, my God. I mean, look at that architecture. Look at that design. Look at that white-on-white -white space. Isn't that amazing? Look at that hair. <laughs> and then, again, coming up on... You know, Washington, D.C., and seeing that, oh, wow, the future isn't what we thought it was going to be. Everything's all changed, and there, there's, the, uh, there's the Senate um, full of books and an old man and a lot of cats. And so these kind of things, and I'm thinking about this, and I'm thinking about those nuclear, those silos and all the fire drills, tornado drills that we've all been through. They don't do that in New York. They don't have these kind of drills. They have, like, something else because tornadoes don't really happen, you know, but they do now. And so I'm, I'm like thinking of all these things, and I'm obsessed with the atomic bomb. Again, back when I was in high school, they made this great movie in Lawrence, Kansas called The Day After, starring Jason Robards, and it was about the day after like the bomb hit, and I'm just obsessed with it. And I'm not worried about dying, but I'm worried all, more worried about things I can't see, like these mega viruses that can knock us out, you know, it can like wipe us out, bird flu. You know, being on the New York City subway and you're seeing people with air masks because you just don't know who's contagious, who's got avian flu, who's just, you know, gross. <laughs> or that giant asteroid. And I don't know if you guys watched CBS Sunday Morning this last week, but they're still talking about the asteroid that we didn't even see that hit um, the northern parts of Russia. And yet we didn't see that. And how many, th how many things are we looking at in the sky? It just like, blows my mind. So, you know, what's going to wipe us out? Is it going to be like something like this huge, like, in, in, in a species like uh, grasshoppers, asteroids. Is it our own stupidity, you know, how we have to just go and fight everyone there could possibly be? Or is it something we have no control over, like the giant tsunami that, like, uh, you know, hit the shores of Japan? Like, what is going to be our demise? I have no idea. But it's what a stuff I think about and I think about every day, and, like, what would happen if I was the last person in New York City? What would it be like? And so I started this series back in 2005 called The City and it postulates a city after mankind. Don't know what happened to us, but we disappeared out of the city overnight. Just gone. And so I'm interested in what happens to the buildings when they're left alone without mankind sitting there taking care of them. So here's like my natural history museum, which is actually on, on, on view here at uh, the museum. And this is the very first scene I, I, I did for this particular series. And the Museum of Art. And this Museum of Art's being overtaken with uh, with honeybees. <laughs> and so that is a feral, that's a, a feral bee have. Actually, someone, someone actually asked me if that was a, as if that was a pork chop. <laughs> I was like, no, that's not a pork chop. That's what a feral beehive actually looks like. And again, I get as many friends to help me as possible. So the, all those paintings were actually hand painted by me, my partner Kathleen, my friend Dan, who lives real close to the museum of uh, the Metropolitan Museum, who goes there every day. And he likes to look at this Madonna and Child painting that they bought for $45 million. It's the size of a piece of paper, eight and a half by 11. It's called like El Duccio, but I'm probably mispronouncing that. And um, so I have my own Madonna and Child but worth $45 million in my scene. And so I'm having a lot of fun. And of course, Broadway, you know, these grandiose movie palaces and ours, this one's like being overtaken by uh, um, blackbirds and ravens. And my friend Dan, again, made the, the chandelier for me. I, he says, well, how big do you want it to be? I said, oh, about the size of a softball. And three months later, he comes back with this amazing sh And I don't tell him what to do. It's just like, make me a chandelier, size of a softball. And he comes back and gives me this beautiful thing. And he actually made it light up so it would actually work because that's just him. So we call this the dandelier instead of the chandelier. <laughs> And the whole scale is based on that piano. It's like a little wind-up um, music box. And so there's always one thing that we can't make. And it's, when I say we, it's my partner, Kathleen, and I, because I, I, I do have help with these. There's always one thing that we can't make, and that kind of sets the, the, the scale for everything else in the scene. So that was the, 
the wind up piano. I think it was called like the Elton John special. And here, the, um, the giant, um, another return to the Natural History Museum. So here it was the, uh, the big dinosaurs that I, that I was able to source off the internet. And I grew up on a steady diet of Saturday morning TV, um, Land of the Lost. And I really liked how they had these ginormous strawberries, and that's all I ever wanted as a kid was one of those ginormous strawberries. So now I have them in my own art history museum. And this scene took a little, took a while, a long time, to create and to shoot. Whenever you buy, like sometimes when you buy a can of salmon, they put the, they leave the bones in, and so I have my little salmon bones in this little case over on the far left side. But boy, does that thing stink after a couple of weeks. Woo! I can tell you and Aquarium, which is also on view here. So here I'm just taking inspiration from Shedd Aquarium in Chicago. And I just like go in, I'll take a point, my, I'll take a point and shoot and I'll take some pictures, but it's really about just what I remember about the space, the quality of light, the colors, and just uh, try to remember back what I saw and take inspiration from that. And this is library. This was, this, um, each of those books have been hand carved out of foam. So this is what it took me, it took me an entire summer, a solid three months to make books, enough books to fill the shelves. And this is like everyone's, everyone's um, favorite scene for the most part. And uh, yeah, had a good time with this one. And I still have all those books. And Fountain. And here I'm thinking that this is like an entrance like to, to the train station, this grandiose uh, sculptural entrance, and someone forgot, like obviously forgot to turn the fountain off and it froze over. And then I have like all these like uh, mattresses and shopping carts from all the people who became homeless and decided to hang out in this particular scene. And what's so funny is we are not, my partner and I are not graffiti people. We actually had to buy a couple of books on street graffiti and then kind of use that as inspiration. We felt like such posers, like making graffiti. <laughs> And of course, we just decided to do all of our friends' name, cat name, couple of friends, yeah. So it's like, God, we have to feel like a poser. Like, here I am, graffiti, yeah. And Brooklyn Botanic, I live across the street from the Botanic Garden, and this confused the hell out of my cats because they're indoor cats. And I come home in the afternoon, and there they are sitting in the middle of this construction, which is nothing more than paper and some plastic and more paper, because I would go around the city of New York and just photograph interesting leaves and then go home and put them into Photoshop and then separate them out, print them out, cut them out with some scissors, put some glue and some wire and remake my plants all over again. So this confused them quite a bit. And then I have all my frogs in the water. And I love there's one frog that actually is looking at you as you're looking at him. And laundromat. And it doesn't matter where you are in the United States, all laundromats look alike. They all doesn't matter, you know? The only thing that does matter is some, ha some allow you to smoke inside and some of them don't. I always understand why someone would want to smoke while doing their laundry, because then your clothes just smell like cigarette smoke, but what do I know? And the only thing real in there is the little cactus, you know? Everything else has been fabricated by, by Kathleen and I and laundromat at night. And I decided to do this because I was so enamored of my little fluorescent lights that I had. And I've spent way too many Friday and Saturday nights at the laundromat under these horrible, horrible fluorescent lights and you can hear them buzzing and everyone else is out having a good time but yet there I am doing my laundry. And there's a time in the city when New York was always, we always have a rat problem but we had a particularly bad rat problem. So, so much so that there was a, a Kentucky Fried Chicken slash Taco Bell restaurant and at night, it would be overrun by rats and some tourists decided to take some video of it and then post it on YouTube and it went viral. Oh, God. It was like, ugh. But, you know, I see them all the time at the, on the subway platform. It's no big deal. As long as they stay down there. <laughs> and so I was inspired by that and decided to have my own little rats. And church. I don't understand how a church loses its purpose and ends up being a nightclub or a bar or a mall, which is like this one church in Manhattan. It's called the Lime Life. It used to be a church, and then it went into the, again, nightclub, bar. So it just amazes me when a church loses its purpose. And then, so here, my church is I like become a sign repository, and I'm really thinking about um, Las Vegas, and I wanted to have this like Vegas, hot desert feel. So when I'm actually doing these scenes, I'm thinking about the quality of light, what part of the United States it might be in. Like to me, this is Miami. It's it's moist, it's humid. I got that, I got that uh, fog machine going again, you know, so I can have that, 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 that feel. 
And I just love how contemporary advertising always likes to do references to, you know, to fine art. And so here, instead of Da Vinci, when man created, you know, when God created man, here you have the hand of God coming down, creating the perfect vacuum. And the next one back is um, Magritte, you know, it's raining vacuums. And then the next poster back, it's a starry, starry night with a little vacuum sucking the stars out of the sky. <laughs> and my absolute favorite one didn't make it on the wall because I ran out of space, and I so wish it would have made it. It's vacuum descending a staircase. <laughs> <laughs> so we're having a lot of fun. And this was about one of the faster scenes. This was about a month in the making. And bar. I had to do a lot of research to do this particular scene. So I had to go to as many bars as possible just to get, no, I'm kidding. But no, my, um, my bar in undergrad in Kirksville, Missouri, the guy, the bar owner was an avid huntsman, sportsman. So avid that he would just pay a couple hundred dollars to go into the next county and, and shoot exotic animals on one of those exotic animal retreats and then bring his trophies back to the bar, which then all the bar, you know, the patrons would then put funny hats on and whatever. So uh, this is my bar. And I'm so worried about being um, sued by any sort of weird corporation for misuse of their images, so I decided to use vintage postage stamps as uh, labels for all the liquor bottles, just so I don't think the US Post Office is gonna come after me, at least I hope not. I know they're like, you know, kind of out of money, so <laughs> who knows. And then of course I had to put in my own favorite video games, which would be Galaga and some sort of pinball machine. And the, that, that, pool table really is to scale. It just somehow, when it was that close to the lens, it like makes it look really tiny and small. So um, unfortunately, that uh, I didn't really catch that until after the photograph was made. And I can't believe I'm telling you the mistake in the, in the photograph, but there you go. Now you won't be able to see that and not see a tiny, tool, tiny pool table. This was about 15 months in the making where all the, all the maps were, were drawn by Kathleen and then I would then take them to the um, flatbed scanner and then scan them and resize them into the proportion that I needed. And all the little uh, decorative elements, again, sculpted by us, refabricated and made into a map room. And again, yeah, everything. And control room. I used to work at a photo lab and there was a photographer who'd just come back from Chernobyl after, he, uh, Chernobyl had been abandoned for about 10 years and they finally started letting people go back. Now it's an actual tourist site you can go and visit if you really wanted to. And as he was photographing this, he could only stay in for about 15 minutes and photograph, then he'd have to run outside. I really don't know what 200 yards is really gonna make a difference as, as far as like nuclear fallout, but you know, so he'd photograph for 15 minutes and then come back out and what, breathe some air and then go back in? Who knows? So this is my own. Uh, so seeing those images just kind of like resonated with me and then I decided to make them myself. And it's really simple materials. Googly eyes that you get at the craft store for my you know, little craft that became like the lenses for these and parts of necklaces and some scrapbooking material and some earrings and all kinds of crazy things to make our, to make our uh, control room. And violin repair shop. Here, all the destruction is on the other side of the window, and the, and the violin repair shop gets to stay you know, in place. And uh, so here, I've actually bought the violins off of Amazon.com. And I love Amazon. I love like, reading everyone's reviews. And so these are just Christmas ornaments. And someone actually had the audacity to give this stuff one star because the violin didn't play. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> it's a Christmas ornament, you know, people. <laughs> Have you guys seen those ad, Bix, Bic pins for her? That was another one of those things at Amazon. There's actually, a, they sell pins just for women, as if, you know, we need our own type of pin. If you guys get a chance, go look up Bic for her and just read the comments. They will <laughs> knock you off your seat. It's so funny. And so, mall. This is a mall that I used to go to in Columbus, Ohio. It was the mall of the city right across the street from Lazarus. It was great, fantastic, and I, I, was t I called up my friend who still lived in Columbus and said, well, I want to come back and take a look at this mall and get more research. And she says, oh, that's been raised. That's now a park. And it's like, what? I guess like, yeah, you know, another mall, a better mall was built on the side of town, and so this one kind of just fell away and disappeared. And another return to the, uh, to the uh, library. And I think what's funny here on the left side is a card catalog. There's going to be a kind of like, how many people, when's the last time you opened a card catalog? 
well, I still remember them. <laughs> I remember that type of research. And uh, anatomy classroom. And this is what we just finished this, this year. I have a show next Thursday opening in New York City, and I'm still working on the last image, but this is like one of the, uh, one of the, um, one of the photographs that'll be on view. And so Kathleen made all of the, all of the anatomy um, models, all based off of various elements that me and my friends have. My friend Catherine is going to the gynecologist, so we have her uterus up there. <laughs> I have a thyroid condition, so I've got a thyroid there. You know, um, Kathleen's mom's hips bother her a lot, so we have a hip up there. So, you know, if you know me and we're friends, you might end up in one of my photographs. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is Subway. And I ride the subway every day to work. This is the B train. And I actually did this pre-Hurricane Sandy. This just, uh, just, it seems like I make a scene and then all of a sudden a natural disaster like it follows. So I've, I want to apologize to the city of New York for bringing down <laughs> Hurricane Sandy on them. And in order for us to do this, you're not supposed to take a camera on the subway. It's kind of illegal now ever since 9-11. But this, this terminates out in Coney Island and we knew exactly where it terminates. It terminates about 15 minutes from where we live. So we just went late at night. We waited for the for the subway to empty, and then I get out the point and shoot and say, all right, Kathleen, go stand next to a door. So I have her like standing next to a door and photographing her, and then we get out the tape measure, and we're just like measuring this thing like crazy, because if I would have gotten the subway out of proportion, trust me, people would have like noticed. And so I had to make sure that everything was in proportion for this particular scene. And this is my uh, space center, celebrating our landing on the moon, uh, yeah, our, our moon landing. And I'm trying to hurry because I'm running out of time. This is a shoe store. So made a, this is how I spent my summer, making little tiny tennis shoes. Just finished this a couple months ago. And this is actually a model of my living room. And this is a little cleaner than what my new living room normally is. <laughs> I didn't make it as messy as possible. But yeah, if you guys ever come visit my studio, this is exactly a replica of it. I actually. Um, went in and, and flatbed scanned every book on the bookshelf. So you can really get a sense of who I am and how like my tastes run because you'll see Babylon 5 DVDs and Battlestar Galactica and all the art history books that I have in my collection that are like, you know, decades old. And so this is my studio. And this is I just finished this on Monday. This is a casino. And I here I am playing with time. It's like the the Luxor in, in Vegas, but it's, here's my, my Egyptian-themed casino, and you're not quite sure how old it is or how new it is, and I'm going to burn in hell because, of course, I had to have the, uh, <laughs> the stroller. <laughs> I just love the fact... This, and this is Kathleen. This is her sense of humor. She's the one who put the tennis ball on the stroller. <laughs> so, Kathleen, man, what a great sense of humor. Together, we have a lot of, a lot of fun. And my mom used to take me to the little beauty shop there in Norton like once a week to get her hair frosted back when women used to get their hair frosted. And so, yeah, so this is like small town. This is small town beauty shop. If it was New York, I'd have to call it hair salon. And you'd be paying $120 for your hair cut. But no, this is beauty shop. And this is actually gives you a sense of the scale. Because people always wonder how big, how small these are. And we build them in various scales because we're not smart enough to build them in the same scale over and over. That would just be too, too, you know, too normal. So instead, we're doing them in all various size scales. And so this is one of the smaller ones that we worked on. And this is what I'm actually returning to. This show that I'm having next Thursday, I, I'm one photograph shy. So I'm working on this very last one called Chinese Takeout. And this is Mugu Gai Pan. Do you, do any of you guys like Mugu Gai Pan? This is really how big it is. This is after, this is Kathleen and she made it out of Sculpey. And this kind of gives you an idea of the scale of the particular scene. And it's kind of even stupid that we're doing this because we could probably find this on the internet, but we're doing this so that we can have our particular image that I then photograph so I can have my Chinese food sign. <laughs> and again, these are all little things that Kathleen's made. And in my neighborhood, it's very West Indy, very, a lot of people from, um, Trinidad and Tobago, and so one of the most popular things they actually sell there is chicken wings and french fries. And so we have to have our chicken wings and french fries, and that's in the lower left-hand corner. And so this is what I get to return to um, tomorrow night and try to photograph in time to get to the, yeah, to get done in time for the show. And yeah, this is what my 
this is what it looks like in my neighborhood. This is the exact, and so this is what we're fabricating. So if you guys go to my website in a month, hopefully you'll see a rendition of this. And I'm doing this as part of my, my series because, you know, this is like, a, it's a place that makes great food, but it still feels like the end of the world every time you're in there because it's just a sad little, you know, that's bulletproof plastic, you know, that's just, yeah. Oh, yeah, and there's another one. That's a General Tso's chicken. And I, so having some, we have a lot of fun. So this is the mall, again. And this is Kathleen sitting inside the mall. So this is one of the biggest scenes we did. This was about um, <coughs> six feet wide, six feet deep. So she's in there, like, giving, putting on some of the uh, uh, elements. And there's my cat, <laughs> who's confused, who keeps on getting on the table because she thinks he's actually in nature. And that's my other cat. <laughs> Who really thinks he's really loving it, even though there's really nothing there for her. And so, because there's two of us working on these, and Kathleen is not a trained photographer, she's actually a trained in glass and glass casting. And I'm still trying to, and I get my, I try to get my ideas across to her. Sometimes we'll make a, a paper model, a little mock-up. And that mock-up then turns into something more like this. And this is, again, in my living room. And I'm using um, extruded foam, the kind of stuff that you buy at the hardware store. It's a great material to work with. And then after we've like, done some more magic to it, it ends up looking like this with all the, the studio lights around it. And this is back when my apartment was still clean. It's not looking that good so far. And this is what it looks like after, it's, you know, after I've done the final shoot. And would you guys, I know you guys, some of you guys have to leave. Do you want to see me go through like, the process from beginning to end of this particular scene? OK, so here's some studio shots. So then we're going to talk about this particular one called um, um, Great Hall. And so I was at the, I was at the muse, uh, Museum of, of Art, at the Carnegie Museum of Art there in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and I really liked the, the colors of, of the museum, so I took out my camera and I took a few um, reference shots. That's my friend Angelica. Hey, Angelica. And because I'm walking around the museum, I'll just take a picture of a little bit of everything. I love that. Is he sitting on the toilet? It just looks like it, the thinker. And then I'm at the Field Museum up in Chicago. And I want to know like the scale of, of dinosaur to, to people so I can get that scale down and just get the whole architectural um, vibe of the place. And so I think that's her name is, I always want to call her Lucy, but I can't remember what her name is. Sue. Sue. But I'm always going to call her Lucy. I just know it. So Sue. Say hi, Sue. And so then I start making out a sketch of what the entire scene's going to be, and those are my fat little toes. And this is so like Kathleen and I could be on the same page as to what I think the design is going to be. And I, I failed drawing, or almost failed drawing, so I'm not a very good drawing person. So it's a good thing she can even read my sketches. And this is the overhead view. And so where you see those little squares will be columns. The big um, cigar shape in the middle will be a dinosaur. And that's, I got this off the internet. I love shopping on the internet. You can get anything you need. And so this came out of China. It's like a, a nice little um, resin model. And so here's the various scales that I've worked in throughout, you know, throughout time. This is where I'm not very smart. We keep changing our, the scales of our, of our people. And so he shows up. He's like the thing that we always keep on the work table to decide like, what the scale of this particular scene is. And so here's the scale that he's going to be at the, at the art museum. I mean, at the... Uh, in the Natural History Museum. And so this is him standing by one of the columns. And those are my fat toes again. And so now we start really fabricating the scene. And uh, you know we have to distress it, make it look old. So we're using this extruded foam and a lot of hot wire and, and hot glue. And these are like replacement balustrade, replacement place pieces to your um, stairway if you should need a new one. You go off to Lowe's or Home Depot and you can get a replacement. And I needed this too so I could have tapered columns. And so I bought a bunch of these and started cutting them down. And now we're putting in little notches to make it look like it's actual limestone or, or marble. And then Kathleen, she has, she has a big background in faux finishes. And so she's the one who comes in and makes everything look old. So she's doing wash after wash after wash. And we made one master column top and we make a silicone mold, and then we make multiples off of that. And so these are the, the, the column toppers after they've been cast in plaster. And that's what it looks like after it's done. And then we need some, like, these medallions. And we decided the size of a nickel is a perfect size. And so we took our nickel and then some polymer clay and made these little animal medallions. And each of these actually speaks back to a scene that had already done. So you have, like, the, um, the jellyfish is looking at aquarium. 
the uh, the penguin is like looking at that natural history museum, that really long one, and then the bees is an art museum. So we get to at least have some fun having references back to other scenes. And we, again, we make silicone molds and then we start casting multiples in plaster. And now it's time to really start putting things together. So that's me like marking things up. And that's what it ends up looking like when they start gluing things together. And there they are in place after the initial wash is being put on them. And there she is with her, uh, her washes. And she uses this stuff called milk paint. And it's great, except that it really starts smelling bad after a couple of, after a couple of weeks because it's basically based on milk. And so it smells like soured milk. So it's like, whew, stinky time. And there they are after her washes. And now it's time to start making the floor. And I need floor tiles. I need a lot of them. So I'm just using like thicker gator board that's been distressed. And so there we are distressing them using like the end of a file, making them look kind of old and aged. And some more pile after pile. You wouldn't believe how many you'd have to make just to like cover the table and start painting them. And that's Dan. <laughs> Dan needs a shave, but Dan always needs a shave. Dan needs a haircut too, but he's out there helping us, working a little bit. And now I'm starting to work on the, the walls, and so again, that pink extruded foam, great material to use. And there's Dan painting away. And now we're starting to set up the scene, trying to get a sense of scale. So you've seen this is like a pretty large scene after a while. And I need a mastodon, and the one mastodon I have is a little too small, so Kathleen's going to sculpt me a bigger one out of that blue foam. And she's a genius. She's, like, fearless. She'll, like, just go and start attacking it. And so then that it is roughed out in the blue foam. And now it's time to keep start painting in some of the, uh, some of the detail shots. And I'm starting to, I took out my little point and shoot, trying to get the kind of the angle that I might want with my camera and just to start seeing if things are actually coming together. Because we don't really plan these. It's more like, let's hope that everything fits together. Cross our fingers a lot. <laughs> Curse a lot as we're putting it together because things aren't working. And so there we are starting to put it together. And now it's time to paint in the sky. Thank God the landlord never comes to my apartment because we have trashed this place so much. That wall has had so many skies. You can't even believe it. And that kind of gives you a sense of how big it's starting to get. And that's still a pretty clean apartment. And now we're starting to put in some of the greenery, putting in the detail shots. And there it, is, it looks like after we get it starting to dry. And we use carrot tops. If you, when you go to the farmer's market, we, get, uh, we can get carrot tops you know, for, from the vendors for free. And they make, it makes great greenery, except for the fact that my cat likes to eat them. And so this cat was always up on the scene. She'd eat the carrot tops, and then she vomits. Thank, thank <laughs> God that floor, that floor has a lot of texture because you can't see the piles that she's left behind. But that's Daisy on the prowl. And we had to lower, we had to drop the table down because we ran out of sky. We ran out of back wall. So me and a couple of friends basically had to cut our table legs off and like slowly lower the model down so we could have enough wall. Oh, what a mess. And so now the cat has access. And there it's starting to look like when it's starting to be set up. And you can see I made the scene much wider. And the first time I shot it, it just didn't resonate. You know, it was just kind of static. And this is one of the first scenes that I actually moved the camera and cut off half the scene that I built just to make it a more interesting shot. And so you don't even see this grand staircase that was there. I moved my camera for this particular angle. And that's the, that's the end.